Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. Today we hear a lot about the taking of black lives by the police and police brutality. The protests have reached a fevered pitch, proclaiming that the police are hunting down black people. But is this correct? Are we being hunted down? Today our guest, Pastor Cesar LaFleur, Executive Director of the Beloved Community Development Coalition, and Sylvia Johnson Matthews, the Executive Director of the Houston Pregnancy Help Center, would say yes. Yet it's not the police for whom we have to worry. It's the abortion clinics who are responsible for the death of 20 million black babies since 1973. We'll talk about this and much, much more when we return. Never before in America's history has there been a more desperate need for a unified voice to fight against the moral decay of our nation. Liberal progressives are pushing an agenda to destroy Judeo-Christian values, and mainstream media and other institutions are promoting the depravity of our nation. At Freedom's Journal Institute, we stand with those who are becoming marginalized simply because of their biblical faith and values. Like you, we are troubled by the racial and political unrest in our society. With the launch of our new online community, the Alliance of Freedom Fighters, we have risen to the challenge in the battle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. When you join our community, you will get access to FJI's digital libraries and information sharing portals, the ability to collaborate with other Alliance Freedom Fighters on both national and local community projects and issues as well as needed support, encouragement, and best practices to champion our shared ideas and values. Go to allianceoffreedomfighters.com and become a part of the Alliance. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. Thank you for joining us today. I want to uh, welcome our guests, the Pastor Cesar LaFleur and Sylvia Johnson Matthews. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the pro-life issue and, and what's going on in the world of pro-life movement. Uh, before we get further into anything else, I think one of the big things we have to do is define what it means to be pro-life and what the pro-life movement actually is. So we'll start with you, Sylvia, if you don't mind. Great. Okay. I think that the pro-life movement can be defined as people who believe that life begins at conception. Um, also, a lot of the people um, in the movement are faith-based in some way, although I have met um, pro-life atheists and pro-life um, other different, it's very diverse. Um, but the goal is that we believe that life begins at conception, and we also believe that honoring women and a child value is defined by the word of God, what God's word has said about it. And what do we need to do to help that woman in need? The pro-life movement is very diverse. And if you can think about the military, we have so many different branches of it, but the goal is to help that mama and to help that baby in any way that we can. So I absolutely love it. I love being a part of it. I love wearing that mantle on my life. And I'm happy that I was created to help other children live. And I, I'm, I'm glad about it. Pastor LaFleur, have anything to add to that? Well, yes, she said it very well, but actually the pro-life movement is exactly that. It's a movement, a collection of individuals of like mind and like belief who saw it necessary to galvanize ourselves and move against an increasingly anti-life culture that we found ourselves living in. It especially picked up uh, steam in 1973 after the Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion according to the Supreme Court in the United States of America. So since we saw an encroaching uh, advance of the anti-life, pro-death, pro-abortion movement across the nation, uh, legislatively and, and socially, we thought it was necessary to bring ourselves together and push back against that to reaffirm the sanctity of innocent human life, to talk about the value of every life, to talk about life being your most essential right. And so that's what the pro-life movement is all about because any other things, no right that a person has means anything if you don't have the first right and that's the right to life. Absolutely. Amen, amen. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually gonna jump to the to Black Lives Matter piece. So how does, how does that, um, 
you know, we've got people marching in the streets and we've got people, you know, talking about racism and everything else and, and marching and uh, getting upset uh, when, a, when a, a black person is killed by a white cop, generally speaking. Um, how does that, um, does it conflict? Is it, some, can, it uh, can they coexist together? Um, what's the challenge here with Black Lives Matter versus a pro-life, a holistic pro-life movement? Say, Caesar. Oh, absolutely. Well, if you were real, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege of speaking with you out in front of Planned Parenthood at the, the event you had called Black Families Matter. And I make the challenge even then is I cannot take any organization or any people credible who say Black Lives Matter if they're not going to be concerned about the Black lives that are being lost. Millions of Black lives have been lost through abortion. The conflict with Black Lives Matter is that I believe they only think certain Black lives matter, as you pointed out the black lives that are being killed by police officers. Last year, we understand that there were 10 unarmed uh, black men that were killed by police officers. 10 unarmed, not necessarily non-combative. But every year, 3 million babies are killed in America. 20 million black children have been aborted since 1973 alone. So my conflict with them as an organization and as a principal is that you cannot be taken seriously when you tell me that you think black lives matter if you are in league with Planned Parenthood, who is the, the, the largest provider of abortions in the black community in the nation. So there's a little bit of inconsistency. I think you're hypocritical, you're not serious. And so I don't take you, I don't take you for real when you say Black Lives Matter. But Sylvia, people would say that, um, that there's hypo hypocrisy in the pro-life movement because they say you only care about babies when in the, in the womb. You don't care about them once they're born. So, so what would you say to that? Um, it's unfortunate that people believe that lie. Our, we have a commitment here at our Pregnancy Resource Center where we provide free services to women that are in unplanned pregnancy situations. And our commitment is to assist them until the baby turns three years old. That's what every single person that comes to our door. Today, we're going to do about 23 uh, women at this one location that will come through these doors and some young men as well. And we're committed to walking with that family hand in hand to see that family succeed. Even if she chooses to place her baby with a family for adoption, if she chooses a single parent. And you know, I love about this ministry, even if after the ultrasound, after she meets with our nurse, after she sees the resources that we have for her that's totally free, if she decides to terminate her pregnancy, we're still going to be there offering her therapy and counseling after the abortion occurs. So we don't just drop women that way. It's not play by our rules. It's that we are here to help you during the most difficult time in your life, the time that you're uh, experiencing an unplanned or a crisis pregnancy. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know you were. Yeah. Uh... You, yeah, you did we that. Do now, is, we now do is, that, <laughs> is that unique to what you all do in Houston? No, it, it really is. There are about 3,000 pregnancy centers across the nation, about um, 2,000 in the United States. And most of us, about 90% of us, provide free nursing, free ultrasounds, free pregnancy tests, prenatal vitamins, uh, diapers, material items, support, maternity homes. Um, I, I mean, just amazing. The list goes on. Counseling, um, college, um, um, classes for dads. This is the good news, like very good news that's being um, snuffed out because at the pregnancy center, the services are free. Unlike at Planned Parenthood abortion clinics, you have to pay for that service. And number two, at the pregnancy center, people leave out alive. That's not going to happen. At the, at the abortion clinic. Somebody's gonna die. Somebody's not gonna come out the doors. A lot of people see this as, uh, and this is a question for Caesar, see this as a political issue. Is it a political, is it just a political issue? No, abortion is a moral issue, but it has been defined in political terms because that's where people would rather talk about it. Talking about it politically kind of absolves you from any moral responsibility of whether what you're doing is right or wrong. But abortion is not a political issue, it's a moral issue. Is it morally right? Is it acceptable for one human being to shed the innocent blood of another human being? The, the Bible says that in, in Proverbs that said there's six things that God hates. Yes, seven is an abomination to him. And the third thing he mentioned was hands that shed innocent human blood. 
So talking about this only as a political issue is a doing a disservice to it. And also it doesn't get you to the spiritual revelation where you need to be. We need to look at this through more than just political eyes. Now I understand that politics is the, the way that we talk about our lives, how we order our lives around politics. But politics have to be built on something more substantial. And the moral issues, the moral underpinnings of any issue is what's important. So any person who would talk about this simply from a political issue is not really addressing the issue. Because I, I had a pastor one time talk to me and he said that we were not um, one issue voters because mm -hmm. um, he felt like those who were pro-life were just, you know, it's just about this one particular issue. And I took issue with his saying it was, we're not one issue voters. I said, oh, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Our one issue is how does our vote glorify God? Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> but, so, but let me just say that even if yeah. it was one issue that you're voting on, this issue is so important. It's almost like in, in, in 1863, those people who were voting against slavery, they said, well, you're a one issue voter. But this is a very huge issue. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is what else matters when it comes down to this. You're talking about Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff that matter. Nothing matters outside of life and life through Jesus Christ. So, yeah, this is the most important issue because we're murdering 60 million people babies. So if that was the one issue I had to pin my vote on, if you're going to accuse me of being a one issue voter, I'll wear that badge very proudly. You have anything to add to that, Sylvia? Yeah, I, I want to say that it's very interesting when people bring up the political um, um, ish, um, opinion. I, I often ask them, well, how much money has your Democrat candidate received from Planned Parenthood in donations, campaign donations? Let's always follow the trail, follow the, money. follow the money. I remember there was a client that came into the pregnancy center and she had changed her mind about having an abortion, but she had prepaid for it. We went to the abortion clinic and when the lady greeted us at the, day, at the door at the abortion clinic, she was nice, she was kind, she had a cross on her neck. She was very, very hospitable to us until it was time to give the money back, mm. the money that was paid for the abortion. Then she began to change and her attitude began to change. I began to see now, follow the money, follow the money trail. What is the roots of the abortion in the black community? What is the roots of abortion in the black churches? What's the root of abortion in our black families? What is, where does that all begin? And it's, it's an ugly, ugly secret that we need to expose and say no more. No more will we pay you to kill our children. No more will we give you the noose to hang our babies and do it. No more will we assist in that. You know, if we took down all these other uh, racist statues, the strongest stronghold of racism in our communities are the abortion clinics. That's a stronghold. Which brings me to our next question. Why, why should the black community be concerned about this, about uh, the rate of abortion in the black community? How, how is the African-American community affected by this? And you can start us off, Sylvia. Okay, I can tell you that I see the women who've had abortions. I see their moms who've had abortions. I see their grandmothers who've had abortions. I see generations of it. The pain, the turmoil, and what comes out of that. All of the pain. We don't have therapy sessions in our neighborhoods or even places for counseling to deal with the after effects of that abortion. I see wounded men. I see, I see one, 99 cars on one Saturday, all black cars rolling into the abortion clinic just up the street from where we are. All black families getting out the doors, walking into that place. I see women who bring me documents that they signed at the abortion clinic that says, we will sell your baby's body parts somewhere mm. else. So they're being exploited in our own community. Can you imagine? This is worse than a Tuskegee experiment. We're paying them to abort our babies and then they're making a profit off of it by selling baby parts. Where's our voting block? We've aborted it. Where's, where's, where is it? It's gone. It's missing. Some people would say, Caesar, that uh, uh, we're now, what, the third largest minority because we've aborted so many babies. Absolutely, Hispanics have passed us up. And you know, to add to that, abortion not only affects us in all the ways that Sylvia says, it affects us economically, you know, it, it, it affects us uh, socially, it affects us politically even, as she pointed out. You know, there's 20 million black voters who are not here. 
Um, I told the story about a, a town in Mississippi that lost a very close election. The black candidate lost by just a very short margin. They went back and they examined the abortion statistics 18 years preceding that. And they saw that they had aborted far more black babies that would have been necessary for them to carry that election, assuming that everyone would have voted the traditional way. So we have to look at it comprehensively, that it is a multi-level negative impact on the black community. But most importantly, it's a spiritual thing with us because can we assume, can we possibly believe that a holy and righteous God will continue to uphold the lives of a people who allow their children to be sacrificed? And I say, no. Mm -hmm. But what do you say to the idea that some people are saying that, you know, it's okay for some people, for some children to be aborted because their quality of life would not be very good and they may get involved, involved in crime and things like that. How do you answer somebody like that? Was it okay for some cops to shoot black people because they were maybe going to commit a crime in the future? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. And it goes against what God's word says. He created us. He knows our future. He gives us, how many chances have the Lord given us? How many, show me the perfect person that was born. It was only one. It's not going to be another one. Okay. But life, life, give them life, living, breathing, child and opportunity to live. Absolutely. To fulfill his purpose in this world. That's important. Amen. Caesar. Amen. Everybody, everybody needs an opportunity to live out their God-given destiny. I met a woman as we were praying in uh, 40 Days for Life in front of the Fall Sports Center who told me about being 15 years old, pregnant, going into the abortion clinic to have an abortion, changed her mind uh, and wanted to come out and didn't know how to get out. But God hid her baby. The nurse came back and told her that she wasn't pregnant, gave her her money and let her go. Six months later, she had a baby girl. And her baby girl grew up to live a very riotous life. She was getting kind of all kind of trouble. And somebody told her it would have probably been better if you had aborted her. And then she said, but look at where I am and where I was when I was 15. God has an opportunity to change every life. There's, a, there's an opportunity for everyone to experience their God-given destiny. And who are we to determine who's worthy of living and who deserves to die? When do we get that kind of authority? When did we become God that we can look into the future and say, this person's life isn't going to be worth it? Worth it to who? It's worth it to God because Jesus died for that life as well. Hallelujah. All right, brother. I was start about to start preaching. preaching. <laughs> you said, Good job. Good to me. <laughs> We're gonna to have to pass the plate in a minute. <laughs> Look, so well, in a few minutes, few minutes we have left. Uh, so the solution, well, how do we, how do we cut back on? I mean, we're probably, I'm not sure where we're gonna stop all abortions. I mean, even when abortion was illegal, it was still being done. But how do we, how do we mm -hmm. stop the number of abortions? Is it, is it because of the breakdown of the family? What, what is, what is the cause and what is the solution? Well, as you've been. You know, I've been saying for the last couple of years, when I had my awakening from the Lord, that the answer to this is a spiritual answer. We're going to need a spiritual awakening in the land and a revival in the church because abortion is a spiritual problem and human solutions will never solve spiritual problems. So we need a spiritual awakening. The nation has to return back to the Lord and the church of Jesus Christ has to have a revival, has to have a reawakening where we stand for righteousness. And the only way it's going to stop is when the appetite for those kind of vile, evil things that's taken away from the people, and that only happens through the Spirit of God. Jesus told his disciples, something only come out by fasting and prayer. The pro-life movement really needs to change and become the leading movement looking for spiritual awakening in this land. We don't need more politics. We don't need more marching. We don't need those things. We need a move of God's Spirit in this nation that will take away that vile appetite for death in vile things in our nation. And that only comes through the spirit of God. So that's how I think it's going to stop. It won't stop until the Lord moves. Amen. Sylvia? From my standpoint, when women come through our doors and they're contemplating terminating their pregnancy, it all goes down to the root of the issue. And that is there's not a trust in God. There's yes. not a belief in who he is. They begin to reject them, their, their own babies in the womb. They begin to uh, self-doubt themselves. If I had a partner in the church that will give the women that we see who Christ is in itself, not a religious movement, but a personal relationship with them and how to move from fear to faith to trust, and then the body of believers come alongside her, 
and they mentor her and they support her and they encourage her so that she can flourish and become what God has created her to be. I know this sounds like um, a, a happy story, but just last night, this client that was homeless, uh, escaped Katrina, came here, um, living in a shelter, became pregnant by someone that was over the shelter, and she had her baby. And guess what she received yesterday? A full scholarship to nursing school. Wow. with her baby. Wow. I was so excited last night, but that was a touch. There was someone that came alongside her at the pregnancy center in her crisis to say that we're going to help you. We're going to mentor you. We're going to be with you. And that's what we used to do before abortion was legal in the black community. There was an auntie, there was an uncle, there was a cousin, right. there was right. someone that would come alongside and help her with that baby. And we need to just get back to those values. And I think we can do it. Amen. 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 Well, look, I want to thank you. We're out of time. I want to thank you both for, for joining us on Kingdoms and Co Kingdom and Conflicts. Uh, Pastor LaFleur, thank you. We, I, I should say Pastor LaFleur, I, I should have said this earlier, has also been, did I say you've been writing for, um, for uh, Freedom's Journal magazine? He's also been involved in a couple of our summits speaking. Uh, as you can tell, he's very on fire about this. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Sylvia Johnson Matthews for being on. My first time meeting you. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to both of you again. Thank you very much. Thank and we'll you. be back thank in just a minute. Never before in America's history has there been a more desperate need for a unified voice to fight against the moral decay of our nation. Liberal progressives are pushing an agenda to destroy Judeo-Christian values, and mainstream media and other institutions are promoting the depravity of our nation. At Freedom's Journal Institute, we stand with those who are becoming marginalized simply because of their biblical faith and values. Like you, we are troubled by the racial and political unrest in our society. With the launch of our new online community, the Alliance of Freedom Fighters, we have risen to the challenge in the battle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. When you join our community, you will get access to FJI's digital libraries and information sharing portals, the ability to collaborate with other Alliance Freedom Fighters on both national and local community projects and issues, as well as needed support, encouragement, and best practices to champion our shared ideas and values. Go to allianceoffreedomfighters.com and become a part of the Alliance. The book of Deuteronomy is the giving of the law for the second time to a new generation that will live in the promised land. The book also serves as a constitution for how the new nation will function with instructions for prophets, judges, kings, and a coming Messiah prediction. It is also an encouragement for the people of the nation to follow the word of the Lord. God has brought them into a new place where there are, quote, great and good cities, end quote. They have not built. Their houses full of good things they have not filled. The text mentions cisterns that they have not have already dug, vineyards already planted in Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 11. The children of Israel are set, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. However, as implied in the garden, there's a warning to not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and the house of slavery in chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. In fact, Deuteronomy is replete with statements of blessings for obedience to, quote, diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies, his statutes, which he has commanded you, end quote, chapter 6, 17. There are also warnings to what will happen if they disobey and serve other gods. You see, Israel will be surrounded by pagan peoples whose practices are ungodly. They will be tempted to act like their neighbors. Yet God gives them specific instructions, the foundation of which are the Ten Commandments found in chapter 5. What is interesting is that there are strong parallels to the testing of the first couple. Israel is told in chapter 30, verse 15, that God has set before them life and good, death and evil, end quote. This vocabulary is reflective of the prohibition in the garden, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that disobedience, eating of the forbidden food, fruit, would bring death, are all represented here. God had placed before Israel, as he placed before Adam and Eve, a choice to obey or disobey. One parallel theme is that the act of disobedience in the garden 
brought the knowledge of good and evil, not the fruit itself. The good would have been to obey God's original command. The first couple learned of evil when they broke that command. In Deuteronomy, Israel will be faced with a similar choice to either follow the commands of the one who delivered them from Egypt and brought them to the land of promise or not. Chapter 30, verse 16 says, If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you will live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. End quote. However, if you decide to disobey as Adam and Eve did, verse 18 will be your plight. Quote, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over to the Jordan to enter and possess. End quote. Therefore, God calls upon Israel to choose life. He calls on heaven and earth as a witness, again connecting us to Genesis, saying in verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Verse 28 tells them to love God, obey his voice, and to hold fast to him. Why? For God is your life and length of days, end quote. So how does this relate to the pro-life movement? The book of Deuteronomy, via vocabulary markers and imagery, is being tied back to the creation narrative. Israel has a choice to make, like the first couple. Adam and Eve were told that their disobedience would lead to certain death. They would surely die. Israel was told the same, you shall surely perish. The positive outcome is that if Israel is obedient, quote, you will live and multiply, end quote. Multiplying was part of the command in Genesis 1, quote, to be fruitful and to multiply, end quote. Have babies. In other words, God is pro-life. He commanded humans in chapter 1 of Genesis to be fruitful and multiply. He repeats the idea in Deuteronomy. In the Decalogue, God commands his people not to commit murder in, verse, in chapter 5, 17. And in verse 30, 19, he pleads with Israel to choose life because verse 20 says, God is your life and length of days. The, the deliberate killing of an unborn child thus cuts across three commands. The first is to be fruitful and multiply. The second is not to murder. And the third is to cho choose life for yourselves and your posterity. Abortion is a transgression of these commands and the very intent of God from the beginning of creation. Therefore, a person who names Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior cannot possibly accept abortion as a right to be protected. It is at cross purposes with the Almighty. Thus, as we use our vote to honor and glorify God, let's choose life. Until next time, God bless.